Math 3 Lesson Summary Video Moving Shadows This lesson is a practice understanding task, which takes concepts you have been working on and applies them to new situations. The purpose of this lesson is to extend the definition of cosine from a right triangle trigonometric ratio to a function of an angle of rotation. To describe the location of Carlos's shadow as it moves back and forth on the ground beneath him, we can measure the shadow's horizontal distance in feet to the right or left of the point directly beneath the center of the Ferris wheel, with locations to the right of the center having positive value and locations to the left of the center having negative values. For instance, in this system, Carlos's shadow location will have a value of 25 when he is at the position farthest to the right on the Ferris wheel, and a value of negative 25 when he is at a position farthest to the left. So if we think back to our previous Ferris wheel, we do know that the radius is 25. We know that the height here above the ground is 30. We know that it takes 20 seconds to do a full rotation. So this is our same Ferris wheel that we've been dealing with. But now we want to think about where is his shadow going to be on the ground? So if he's here at point A, where we know that T is equal to zero, that's what we had established previously. If he's A, his shadow is going to fall right here on the ground. So we're looking at the ground at his shadow. So at this point, if we're measuring from here, we said we were measuring from where the axis of the Ferris wheel, the axle is. So this would be zero. And we said to the right was going to be positive and to the left was going to be negative. So at t equals zero, his shadow should be falling right here, and that is the radius away. So that should be 25. So at zero, he should be 25 feet to the right of the middle. If we continue on around up to the top, we know again the radius is 25. So um, we're we're up here at the top, but now his shadow should be falling right here on the ground, like on top of the Ferris wheel. So he's gonna have that shadow right here at the middle and it's actually at zero. Now we did determine the other day that with our 20, 20 seconds to go all the way around, one fourth of the way around would be five seconds, halfway around would be 10 seconds, three fourths of the way around would be 15 seconds, and then all the way around would be 20 seconds. So that's the five second mark. So at the five second mark, uh, Carlos is going to be right at the top of the Ferris wheel. So his shadow is going to be in the middle. And then when we come over here to the 10 second mark, his shadow is going to be falling down here. And that's going to be 25 feet to the left. So that's going to be negative 25. So at 10 seconds, we're down here at negative 25. Um, at 15 seconds, we make it down to the bottom. And so again, our shadow is going to be right there at the middle. So it's at zero. And then we work our way at 20 seconds to get back where we started. And so that's where our shadow is going to be at the 25 mark. And if we continue that on around again at 25 seconds, we would be back at the middle. And at 30 seconds, we would be back at the bottom or the, the negative 25 all the way far to the left. And then back down here at 35, we'll be back at the middle and back at 40. That's two full rotations around. We would be back over to the left. So we can get an idea of what this situation is going to look like. So just kind of thinking about it as we've thought about it the last couple of days, we, we figured out what our outermost reaches would be. The furthest I can go to the left is 25 feet because that's my radius. And the furthest I can go to my right is 25 feet because that's my radius. So that's the farthest I can go. It is cyclic. So it's repeating itself. So that's why we ended up with another one of these periodic. And in fact, it looks almost identical to what we were working on previously. But now we're not dealing with a vertical height, how high he is off of the ground. Now we're dealing with where's his shadow? We're going back and forth, left and right, instead of up and down. 
but notice it has a very similar situation. It's periodic, it's cyclic, it's still going up and down on the graph because this is actually describing our left to right behavior on the circle. Now we want to calculate the location of Carlos's shadow at the times t given in the following table where t represents the number of seconds since Carlos passed to the position furthest to the right on the Ferris wheel. So we're starting here, just like we did last time. This is our t equals zero, starting at point A, the furthest to the right. And then we wanna figure out what is our, our distance. So again, we're looking at our shadows down here. So his shadow when he started, we figured out this was his shadow when he made it to the top or the bottom. And this was his shadow uh, when he made it all the way to the left. So all of our shadows should be falling somewhere between negative 25 and positive 25, but we need to figure out what are those distances. So this one second, two second, three second, we need to go back and again reference what we've been working on. We figured out that if it takes 20 seconds to go all the way around, that we were going 18 degrees per second, so to go 36 degrees, point B here would really be the two second mark, and C would be the four second mark, and D was gonna be, so we're counting by twos going around on our actual points here. Uh, that was what we had figured out the other day. So we can find all of these even values just by finding our, the points that we have here on the circle. And then again, we get back to where we started at the 20 second mark. So I think I'm going to skip some of these in-between ones at first and just find the points that we've already worked with. So we already have a nice reference triangle. Don't forget, we always want to use a reference triangle. We know our radius is 25 feet, and we know that our angle here in the middle, our angle of rotation is 36 degrees. But this time I'm not looking for my height. This time I'm interested in figuring out what is this value. We want to know our distance from the center. So I'm interested in this D value. So now I have to think in reference to that angle, this is the adjacent side. And this is the hypotenuse. And if we think back to our trig functions, adjacent and hypotenuse, that was our cosine. Cosine is equal to the adjacent over the hypotenuse. So cosine of an angle is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse. So our angle is 36 degrees, and our adjacent is what we're looking for, and our hypotenuse is 25. So in order for me to get that sideways distance, I'm just going to have to multiply both sides by 25. And when I do 25 times cosine of 36 degrees, I get that my distance was 20.2 feet. And that would make sense. If this over here is 25, that is a little short of that. And that looks like it would be about 20 feet. So 20.2 feet seems reasonable. So when we think about how we're actually finding these, it looks like this time, since we're doing side to side and we're looking for this horizontal distance, we're not dealing with sine anymore. When I did this, I had to do the radius times the cosine of the angle in order to figure out what my sideways distance was. So let's see if that works for all of them. If I wanted to find C, its distance is going to be right here. When we find C, it was to four seconds. And if it's four seconds, four times 18 was 72 degrees. So it's going to have a 72 degree angle. Its radius is still 25. So when we do 25 times the cosine of 72 degrees, we find that that D distance is 7.7 .7 feet. That also makes sense because it's much shorter than the 25. It's getting very close to the center. So for that to be 7 absolutely makes sense. Now let's check out 6, because 6 has that wonderful, we, we ran into this when we were doing uh, the height, it's past 90 degrees. I want to see what kind of effect it being past 90 degrees has on taking the cosine. So let's see, if we're going to, 
if we're going to do this, that's its reference triangle, and its reference angle is going to be two of those 36. So its reference angle is 72 degrees, but the actual angle of rotation is uh, 6 times 18, uh, which is 80, 90. Nope. It's past 90 because that was five. So it's going to be 108, 108 degrees. So that's well past 90. That's a lot past 90. So if we find for 72, we figured out that that is 7.7, .7, but it's on the left-hand side. Remember our symmetry? We have all that lovely symmetry. Our symmetry would tell us that this should be 7.7. .7. It just needs to be negative because now it's on the left-hand side. So for six, I would expect it to be negative 7.7. .7. I'm curious to see if I still use this, and if I plug in that angle of rotation of 108, if I will get the same thing. And when I type in 25 times cosine of 108 degrees, it does in fact turn out to be negative 7.7. .7. So we can see that cosine seems to be compensating for our angles of rotation. And again, that's how the function was designed. It's taking into account that reference angle and it's helping us to understand these degrees can continue going. We can go past 90 degrees. That just physically means that I'm on this side of that center. I'm now on the left side of the center instead of the right side of the center. So this is negative and this is positive. So we can continue. We said eight seconds would be at point E. But I also know that I have symmetry here. This one was 20.2, so that means that this one must be at negative 20.2. If we figure out where 14 seconds is, so this was 10, 12, here's 14 seconds. So if this is 14 seconds, that has some symmetry with D. They're both the same distance, so 14 seconds must also be negative 7.7 because it's still on the left hand side over here uh, we get to 16 and we get to 18 so 18 is going to have symmetry with this one this is positive 20.2 feet so all of that lovely symmetry circles are still perfectly symmetrical so we can still match things up it's just instead of sine remember b and e had the same sine value but it looks like B and J now are the ones that are both positive 20.20. And the negative 7.7s, they were both D and H. You know, these are the ones that match up now. So it looks like things are very, very similar, but they are slightly shifted. And so this is where we're going to see we are developing the cosine function. So just like with sine function, the cosine function is going to take that right triangle trig, but instead of thinking about it as the angle in that right triangle, we're thinking about it as this angle of rotation around the circle. So there's always a reference triangle that it associates to. There's a positive side and a negative side to the circle. And we're talking about our distance now going left to right instead of our distance going up and down. Let's quickly capture some similarities and some differences that we may have initially noticed between the sine and the cosine function. The first thing is that they do both make waves. They are both periodic functions, and in fact, their waves look almost identical. They pretty much are identical, actually. So sine and cosine functions, they're still spinning around the circle. That's going to make their graphs have the same shape. So that's something that we're going to have to really pay attention to and keep up with. Uh, both of them, the amplitude of our wave, how high it went and how low it went, is determined by the radius, which totally makes sense. They're both spinning on the same circle. So the radius is what's really driving that wave. How far can they go in either direction? The first difference we may really notice is that sine started by going up and then it came back down, went back up and then came back down. Cosine, however, started by going down. It started by getting smaller, 
And then once it bottomed out, it started coming back up. So that was something that was different about their waves. If you think about it, that really affects where their wave starts. They're both creating these waves. These waves have the same shape. Really, the only difference between the two is that the sine starts its wave at the midline. It starts in the middle, goes up, comes back down, goes to the bottom, and comes back up to the middle. It starts at the midline. Cosine actually starts at the very top of the wave, at the maximum, and then it just falls all the way down and then comes back up. So they both have waves, but they're starting at different points on the wave. And that's really the only difference between sine and cosine. The other thing, as far as context is concerned, is that sine is really looking for the height on the circle as you spin around the circle. When you're going around the circle, you're looking for that height above the midline or below the midline. And with cosine, we're thinking of a horizontal distance. So even though we still have a midline going through the center of the circle, we're more interested in how far to the right and how far to the left am I, as opposed to how far above and how far below the center am I. So that's the real contextual difference between the two. If we think about our sine and cosine functions, their input is always the angle of rotation, so this angle that we are rotating. Their output is our location on the circle. We always have a reference triangle because we know that sine and cosine are trigonometric ratios. And in that reference triangle, that point that we land on the circle, that location, the X is this side of the triangle, the horizontal side of the triangle, and the Y is that vertical side of the triangle because that's our distance from the origin left to right and our distance from the origin up and down. And so that gives us our reference triangle. If we think about what is this X value always going to be, in order for us to find the X value in this reference triangle, it's the adjacent over the hypotenuse, so it always ends up being the radius times the cosine of the angle of rotation. And that y value always ends up being the radius times the sine of that angle of rotation. And so we also know x is that horizontal distance, that's what cosine measures, y is the vertical distance, and that's what sine is measuring. We talked about that. We also know things about the different quadrants of the circle. We have the first, the second, the third, and the fourth quadrant of the circle. We know all of the points in this first quadrant are positive, positive. This means that in that first quadrant, the cosine is going to be positive, as well as the sine is going to be positive. All of the points in the second quadrant, the first value is negative, but the second one is positive. That means in this quadrant, cosine is going to be negative, but sine is going to be positive. In the third quadrant, both numbers are negative, so both the cosine and the sine are going to be negative. And in the fourth quadrant, we have positive negative points. And so therefore, the cosine will be positive and the sine will be negative. Notice the patterns here. Cosine is always positive in the first and fourth quadrants and negative in the second and third. And so it has uh, reflection over the x-axis. They match up over the x-axis. For sine, the positives are the first and second, and then the negatives are the third and fourth. So they have reflection over the y-axis.